our next speaker uh, has been one of the brightest spots in the OGIB portfolio. We uh, bought this stock with uh, ridiculously lucky timing. And uh, I, I first heard Athabasca Oil speak uh, in Vancouver at a, a lunch meeting la late last year. And I went, okay, that, that actually sounds pretty interesting what they were able to do in terms of getting themselves out of a bit of a pickle. And, uh, but the chart was saying it wasn't the right time yet. And then as the chart turned uh, and all these heavy oil stocks just got the sun shining on them, uh, it's just so gratifying to see the market validate your ideas. And, and this stock has had a great run. And, and so CEO Rob Brown is going to give, give us an idea on, on how they were able to position themselves to really start thriving in this type of oil environment and uh, where they're going to go to from here. Rob. Well, thank you very much, Keith, and good afternoon. Very pleased to be here today to give you an overview of Athabasca Oil and talk a little bit about how we're positioned. Um, before I begin, Athabasca, and I'll go through this, we're actually um, a heavy oil player, so we're a thermal oil player in the SAG-D uh, area near Fort McMurray, but we're also a light oil player. And we have assets in the Duvernay and the Montney, and I'll show you a little bit about that. But I, uh, I did attend the Bill Morneau um, meeting today, uh, where he talked about his Kinder Morgan announcement. And um, yeah, I also attended the friendly uh, protesters, our protesters, ahead of time. And uh, I got to say, he said the right things. Uh, so the things that I heard was there's acknowledgement from this government that, that they shouldn't have been in the middle of this in the first place that um, they don't intend on being in the middle of uh, what should be uh, private company uh, investments in Canada, and unfortunately it got to this place. I think most importantly, I heard a commitment to build the pipeline, and uh, they're absolutely committed. Uh, there were protesters in the meeting that were uh, removed, and he said, we're prepared for that, we know it's coming, and we're gonna build this pipeline. So, um, Rachel Notley was a little early on her victory lap, in my opinion, but uh, now we need to get this thing built, and it will benefit Athabasca shareholders in the long run. So, um, with that, um, I thought I'd just maybe uh, just a, a couple of minutes on what's happened with Athabasca Oil. You may know Athabasca Oil from uh, 2010 when it IPO'd. I was not with the company at that point in time. I've been with the company about five years, and um, the management team at Athabasca is a different management team than the startup. The board of directors is different, and we've taken a different approach. So we've taken a company that had a very big land base, but essentially no cash flow. And our objective was to take these assets, zero in on the very best ones. We've done some creative strategic transactions, which has accelerated the cash flow of the company and positioned it for, in my opinion, uh, where we are today and um, what looks to be a, a fairly bullish oil price environment. Um, the transactions that we did, uh, we first did a joint venture with Murphy Oil on our Duvernay assets in the KBOB region. That was really uh, a transaction that saw us get a billion dollars invested in those assets over a four-year time horizon and we're about halfway through that and uh, we've got a very competent operator in Murphy Oil drilling shale wells and we retained a 30% interest and there's very little um, impact on our balance sheet to fund that first billion dollars. Um, the second transaction we did, and I can confidently say it's the gold standard of royalty deals. So we had a lot of long dated royalties uh, or assets in the company. Um, we, uh, we found an investor, uh, a couple of gentlemen I got to know qu quite well and uh, private wealth out of the US, and they're interested in owning barrels in the ground, and obviously a bullish view on oil. So we did a royalty deal where we gave them a sliding scale royalty between two and 12%, and um, that 2% does not kick in until oil hits $60 WCS price in US dollars, net of transportation and storage. So even at today's price, we're a country mile from paying the first 2%, and what we got is $400 million for that. And so that armed our balance sheet with a cash position. We countercyclically bought Statoil's uh, Canadian assets. We were the first mover to buy um, some assets that are top quality, and we got a heck of a good deal on it. And uh, Statoil ended up taking a 20% interest in our company. So they're 20% owners of our company. So I tell you that just to give you a little bit of the background of how we've transitioned to where we are today. And so you can see from this first slide that we have uh, we're now just over 40,000 barrel a day producer. We're 90% oil weighted. We probably have the lowest decline rate in our uh, comparable peer group, about 10 or 11% uh, decline. 
And uh, we have assets in some of the top plays. So we have an interest in the Duvernay. We're actively drilling Montney wells in that region, which are very competitive. And then we have our oil sands assets. We have lots of running room and our balance sheet is in good shape. So our market cap is close to a billion dollars. It was over a billion uh, here last week. Um, our net debt positions uh, $367 million, but we have $330 million of funding capacity. Um, and our reserve position is obviously very strong with the thermal oil. Um, this is the snapshot of, of our corporate strategy and where we want to go. So um, we've taken production and, and grown it almost from a standing start to, uh, like I said, over 40,000 barrels a day. Our guidance for 2018 is uh, 38,500 to 41,000, so call it about 40,000 barrels a day. Um, we see a 15% CAGR growth through our uh, funded capital program in our assets. Um, we have profitable liquid rich growth in the light oil and then of course we have a stable uh, production base with our thermal oil um, assets. I think our execution has been very good. Operationally, we've been hitting our targets. We've, um, we're, we've been very careful not to overpromise uh, on what we've been doing. And I think most importantly, in terms of funds flow, it's the bottom right graph that you see here. We've come from a place where uh, we had some big projects to finish. We had overspent uh, capital in the historically, and we didn't have the cash flow. This year, we're projecting $145 million of funds flow, and uh, we'll spend about $140 million of capital. So we're spending within our means, and we see a future where we're uh, largely free cash flow positive in a pretty significant way. So these, this, this was built on $65 pricing uh, and uh, flat, and a $20 differential this year, and a $17.50 differential beyond that. So just to give you a basis. Um, this is a slide that um, our VP of uh, uh, Capital Markets uh, put in here, and I think it's a great one. It, it talks about um, what is the upside for this stock. And um, we really, I, I just showed you a graph that we believe we have growth built into this company, but we don't just need oil prices to run to see value uh, go up, but when it does, we are super torquey. And um, if you look at it, we're 90% liquids, and a $5 move on oil price is $80 million of cash flow for our company. And a f similarly, a $5 uh, or a 250 change on WCS is about $45 million, or million dollars to, uh, on an annual basis. So um, the graphs on the right, they're not our research, that's Peter's. And uh, so they put out numbers on us and they compared us to uh, our peer group. And when you look at the cash flow sensitivity in 20. Uh, 19 when you go to a 70 or $75 oil price, we're a standout. And so we're really on the right-hand side of this graph. And then when you look at the valuation, um, similarly, if you look at um, EV over uh, debt-adjusted cash flow and debt, uh, debt to cash flow, we have, uh, as oil prices go up, our valuation becomes much more compelling with the compression of the multiple, and our debt to cash flow is quite low. In 2019, it'll be sub one times. So we're positioned very well with our, uh, relative to our peer group and we feel really good about that. So I talked a little bit about market access and I think that's the most topical thing, you know, particularly for a thermal company in Alberta and what's our view on it. And, th and the first thing that I remind people is that um, although our light oil production is about 25% of our uh, production base, it, it currently is making up about half of our cash flow. So we have very uh, good economics on our liquid uh, rich light oil production and that's, that's really helped uh, mute the, the impact of differentials in our company. So we have a bit of a built in protection uh, by, by being diversified like that. Um, you know, our liquid uh, production and our egress out of our light oil is very good. We have lot, we're pipeline connected to Pemina, we're connected to Alliance and TCPL. In terms of our gas production, low gas price is good for us. And as much as I want to see uh, the gas price environment get better for Western Canada, the fact is we're a net consumer of gas because we use it in our sag defus you know, operations. So the lower the gas price is, the better our operating costs on that side of the business. Now in terms of thermal oil, um, you know, our, we, so we're willing to hedge up to half our corporate production to protect our cash flow profile and make sure that we can, ex we can do our capital program. We did that in the first half of the year. 
Uh, we're really focused on that differential. We think it's going to be defined by rail economics, whether we're shipping on a pipeline or on rail, ultimately we will end up paying rail economics with that differential. And uh, our view is it's probably in the $17 to $20 range on the back half of this year. We budget on the $20 uh, uh, end of the spectrum. You know, and our oil price is $65, so if it goes to $22 and oil's at $67, you know, it, we're, we're kind of a net wash on that. So we think we've budgeted accordingly. Um, we have been mitigating apportionment, and that's where it really hits you if you have distressed barrels where you don't have space and you've got to get it into storage somewhere. That's where you get hit really hard on the differential. So uh, we've been doing um, contracts where we can with refineries who have space and pipelines. We've contracted space in Edmonton. Um, you can see 130,000 barrels of storage. And then longer term, we've made commitments on the pipelines, and uh, I'm a believer they're going to get built. And so we have 20,000 barrels a day on TMX, and we have 10,000 barrels a day on Keystone XL. So we're diversified. These are long-term reserves. We've got a 70-year reserve life on our thermal properties, and, um, and uh, they need to be on pipelines uh, in the long term to be highly, highly profitable for our shareholders. I think uh, I'll just talk briefly about the assets. Um, so our Montney assets are in KBOB, so uh, near Fox Creek. It's an area we call Placid. So we, uh, as part of the joint venture we did with Murphy, we retained this area as operator. We own 70% of it. It's our capital program. We took a pretty methodical step into it, drilled a couple of wells, um, did a five well program and got the confidence to build the facilities in this area. So we have a battery in this area. We're pipeline connected to our own operated facilities. We have access to two midstream plants. Most of our gas goes to the Kira Simonette plant and all of our liquids goes to uh, on the Pemina pipeline system and it's essentially a diluent for our thermal production. We've taken production here from a standing start to, to uh, just about 10,000 barrels a day in about two years. And uh, I'll show you what the economics of that look like. So like every, uh, whether it's a shale play or a tight, tight uh, gas play, um, co completion design is important. So we've changed our completion design over time. We've drilled longer horizontal laterals, bigger fracks. And you can see we've seen an improvement in results with each generation of completion that we've done. And our type curve is currently the dashed line on here. That is a move up in type curve from last year and we've consistently been beating it with our most recent wells. The great thing about this area is it's very liquid rich. So a, a typical well will come on at 1,000 BOE per day. It, of that, it's about 60% liquids, and it's a high quality liquid. So um, I'll just point you to type well economics, and, and it's important that you know that this is single well economics. At $65 um, oil, it costs about $8 million to drill and complete a well and get it tied in. These wells pay, in, pay out in about a year. And uh, the great thing is our net back is so strong. It's about $37 on a single well basis. So we think that's good, um, a good investment for shareholders. We've drilled about 30 wells here. We have another 200 that we can easily drill. Um, and those are, um, those are risk locations. So uh, we feel very confident in that inventory. A typical single rig would drill about 15 wells in a year. So it gives you an idea of the running room that we have there. Um, talk briefly about uh, the Duvernay. So we had about 200,000 acres of land here and, and the issue for Athabasca is there was no way to fund it, particularly with uh, oil prices declining. So we found a partner in uh, Murphy Oil that was a cash carry deal for us and it came with a $220 million carry provision. And what that allowed us to do is Murphy is spend, spending 75% uh, of our 30% uh, working interest is funded by them until that carry is gone. And so when I talked about a billion dollars spend over four years, the net spend to us is $75 million for a 30% working interest. So it's a really um, constructive way to see capital deployed in the asset, to de-risk the asset. It's an asset that needed de-risking uh, further. Um, we like it because super majors are our neighbors. And uh, you can't see it on this map. If you went to our corporate deck, you would see uh, Shell, Chevron, in Canna, our biggest uh, neighbors. And um, you can see all the red circles on this uh, map. Those are wells that have been drilled in the last couple of years. And uh, there's some really exciting data points on there. And uh, we're seeing areas that are getting de-risked with comparable economics to what I just showed you on the Montney. 
And um, our view on this is by the time that carry runs out, this should be a self-funded play. We'll know the areas that work, that make money, that we can use our cash flow to fund, and uh, the areas that haven't worked, we're not exposed to anymore. We don't have to spend capital on there. It's an extremely protective joint development agreement with Murphy, and a lot of people ask me about this, but that, that deal contemplated dollars invested and it contemplated scope of work. So uh, I've done a few uh, JVs in the past and when I worked in the US, and um, this JV requires unanimous approval on changes to budget, changes to five-year plans, changes to scope of work. If they don't spend the money that they're supposed to spend in their five-year plan, it's payable to us in cash in the year. So the idea is they can't hold our money and not spend it. We'll decide what we do with our money. So it's a really ne uh, neat deal and it uh, kind of kick-started everything. Um, when I talk about light oil netbacks, um, and I mentioned that earlier, this is a, a graph, and we had the same one for Q4 last year, this is Q1 this year. This is what every operator in the Montney and Duvernay space has reported, and everybody thinks that, well, 7Gens obviously has the best netback, and operators with big scope. These are the real numbers. Our netback was number one in Q4, it was number one in Q1. We were um, almost $26 of BOE, and we don't have the scale that those operators have. What we do have is liquid rich production and we have a high quality product and we have extremely low lifting costs. We own our facilities, we operate it. Um, you know, I'm biased of course, but I think we have a, a you know, class A operating team and people that I've worked with my whole career and uh, we're pretty proud of those results. Um, so this is the light oil growth profile. You can see we've put a very modest uh, activity program, funded activity program, that gets us to about 20,000 um, BOE per day in uh, 2020. Um, compelling economics. This year, what's to come? We've uh, just brought on a pad of Montney Wells. We've drilled another six well pad of Montney Wells. It's not completed yet. Um, we'll look to guide on capital uh, in the back half of the year on that. Also continued drilling. Montney is the lever on cash flow. So, you know, if we're thinking, um, you know, differentials are a little high, that's our area we can pull back. We don't have land expiries. And um, that's probably uh, what I was gonna say about light oil. This is, this is a complete shift of gear. So this is our thermal oil assets. And um, we have two producing properties. One is called Leesmer. So that's one of the assets that we bought from Stat Oil. And uh, it produces between 20 and 22,000 barrels a day. Last month it was 22,000 barrels a day. And we've committed to keep it in that range. Um, so uh, it's a top quality asset. It's uh, break even price is about $44 uh, WTI. Um, we expect it'll, it'll spit out $80 million of free cash to the corporation this year. And so that was the idea. It can spit out free cash. We can use that money to invest in light oil, increase the margins of the company, and uh, reduce the risk profile of the company and uh, have a really robust uh, cash business. Um, the Hanging Stone asset is one that was Legacy Athabasca, so that was sanctioned um, uh, several years ago. We saw it through to completion. It's not as good a quality asset as Leesmer. So the rock quality is not as good. It produces about 10,000 barrels a day right now, so it's got a higher break even. The nice thing right now is it, it's new asset, so it doesn't require capital to be invested. We can continue that ramp up to a nameplate of about 12,000 barrels a day. And, um, and then, um, you know, in future years, we'll look at, at sustaining capital and, and uh, additional uh, investment there. I just will briefly mention the asset called Corner. And so you can see it's right on the pipeline corridor. That's another asset that we acquired from, Athba or from Stat Oil. Um, that has a 40,000 barrel a day AER regulatory approval in place. It's all the delineation wells are drilled, all the observation wells are drilled. That asset is ready for development. And um, the way Stat Oil looked at this is Leesmer was their demonstration project. You can go to the site today and they call it demonstration. They tried all their technology, solvent injection, we're doing uh, non condensable gas injection, ho played with horizontal tech well techniques. And their idea was to take all that technology and apply the best of it to corner because corner's a better quality reservoir. And our reserve uh, evaluators who are McDaniels said that's the best undeveloped oil sands asset left. And so 
We're proud to own it. It's not in our five-year plan, but it's not going anywhere. And that's future upside for the company. Obviously, there'll be a, we'll have to find a way to fund it in the future, but we've been pretty creative on that front in the past. So I um, thought I would point that out. So as far as our thermal oil outlook, this is, this is what it looks like. Um, it obviously makes a pretty significant uh, piece of our overall production um, and cash flow. Um, our budget for 2018 is about $70 million, so it's half of our corporate budget. What that goes towards is um, we are doing, there's four pre-drilled wells that were drilled by Stat Oil. We'll bring those on stream this year. We just tied in um, the Norlite pipeline to our facility. So previously, Stat Oil was railing in all the diluent that's to be blended. Now with Fort Hills up and running, Enbridge and Kiara built uh, the Norlite pipeline. We tied into it. So we'll save about $20 million a year just through that tie-in. So there were some real low-hanging fruit that we could get after um, right away. And uh, we've put in some flow control devices, optimization, recovery factor is only just over 30% on the wells that are drilled. It'll easily be over 65% by the time uh, we're, we have to drill more wells. So, so we feel really good about this uh, set of assets. Good quality rock, it's about a 3, three SOR, which um, you know, if you look at SORs, it's, that's, you know, in the top quartile. It's not the best of the best, but it's, it's very good. Um, so that's, that's the thermal oil side. And there's one piece that I, I should mention, and um, I think uh, Keith has, has highlighted this, and I'll just mention it to you, is sometimes when you buy things from a super major, you get things that are worth a lot that you didn't have to pay for. And um, we own a tank farm that is right outside the Enbridge Cheecham terminal. It's uh, 300,000 barrels worth of tank space. We have a big footprint, it's expandable. We're pipeline, we own the pipelines that come up to our asset, both diluent and dil bit. We are now pipeline connected to Norlite. We're pipeline connected under the highway to the Enbridge main terminal. We're the only terminal that is pipeline connected to the Kiara rail terminal in the area. It's in the right address. And uh, quite frankly, we don't get credit for it in our share price. And um, we felt it was a prudent thing to do to explore the value on it. So we're, we're doing that. We're running a process right now with RBC. We'll see uh, what it's worth. We'll see, I'm envisioning there's going to be somebody on the other side of the table that has a lower cost of capital or perhaps a creative deal that they can work with us. Uh, we like to be creative. And, um, and uh, been intentionally vague on what we would do with proceeds, um, but uh, we'd like to keep our balance sheet very strong, particularly as a heavy oil producer. We want to... We want to make sure our debt is low. We want to make sure there's lots of torque in uh, oil price and that we can adequately be resilient to any headwinds that come our way. And, um, and we do see growth opportunities for this company as well. So stay tuned on that. It's probably not till a Q3 type uh, event and we won't leave it hanging out there. So if we decide to transact and we have a good use of proceeds, we'll make sure we let uh, shareholders know. If we decide not to transact, we'll make sure we let you know why. And, um, and uh, just, just like to be clear on that. So that's, uh, that's the slides that I intended to show you today. And uh, we do think that um, we are a differentiated uh, intermediate producer. We have a low decline. We're in some of the best plays and um, very oil weighted. So uh, with that, I'll just conclude. Well, I think, to be honest with you, Keith, there's a number of different county counterparties or potential counterparties, and they'll all have a different view on that. You'd have a finan financial counterparty that looks at it and says, it's a great asset that's tied to long-term reserves, and we have a low cost of capital, so that's a good investment for us. There's uh, midstreamers who would look at that and say, man, that's in the right address. It is connected to everything. It's expandable, and it's flexible. That, that would be a really neat asset to own where we can optimize its usage and, and generate uh, cash. And then there's others that may look at it like you're talking about and saying, you know, it's 300,000 barrels, but we could double its size or triple its size and, it's, and, and uh, it could be very strategic. So, and, and that would be capital we would never spend. Um, you know, it's not our strategy to be a midstreamer and generate revenue that way. So, um, 
So we're exploring that and we'll see. Yeah, so we, we don't generate revenue on it right now. We use it strictly for ourselves. So um, obviously if we did a deal where we sold it to somebody, we'll have to pay a, a fee, right, to use it back. So it's kind of a lease back scenario. Uh, I, I, so I, I can give you a, a bit of a range because it's going to be the higher the upfront, upfront proceeds you want, the bigger the toll is that you're going to pay and vice versa. So um, replacement cost on the tank farm would be just over $200 million. And, uh, and uh, it's built today standing there. I think it's worth more than that. And, um, you know, we've looked and, uh, you know, we're very conscious that we don't want to burden the asset with a high toll. So we've looked at all the best operators and we have a toll in mind, a maximum we'd be willing to pay to stay competitive and make sure that we're, we don't put Leesmer in an uncompetitive situation. So it's probably the best I can tell you at this time. Yeah. Yeah, well that one there, I mean, it's, it's just a tank farm, right? So um, it, you could easily double it. Like I have drawings that show that the doubling of it and the footprint would be larger than that. So um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's got some neat features. And I think the most important thing is there's two 30 inch pipelines that we own that connect us to Enbridge, which is one of the biggest tank farms in uh, Western Canada. Uh, no, it would be north of that, Keith. It would be billion, billion plus. And I, I'm a little reluctant to, uh, you know, I've seen what Statoil was estimating. Everything we've done is probably 60 to 80 percent of what Statoil estimated or thought would, things would cost. So I know we're cheaper. Um, we, we're looking at things like remote steam generation. It, it's actually not that far away from Leesmer. We could take advantage of facilities that we have there and um, just do steam generation on site and, and get, get the ball rolling. So there's, there's incremental steps we can take. Um, but one thing we're not going to do is risk our current balance sheet. So we're going to have to find a way to fund that stuff. And, um, you know, we th we're thinking that at $65 oil, the project starts to look pretty good. So... Well, Leismer also has a 40,000 barrel a day approval. So we're about half that, call it. So we could expand that as well. And, you know, to be honest, that's probably better economics right now than corner, just because we've got the central processing facility there and we've got infrastructure in place. So on my first slide, when I said we have 80,000 barrels a day of, call it brownfield type expansion work, it's Leismer, it's corner. Corner would be a cross between green and, and brownfield. And then, um, you know, we could do work at Hanging Stone as well. Yep. I, I, there's economies of scale in there that you have to be mindful of. So when we look at corner, the probably the smallest step you do is a 20,000 barrel a day phase. And uh, Leesmer, that's different. And, um, you know, and, and, and to be honest with you, um, so the Leesmer plant has four steam generators. I mentioned before that when you buy an asset, sometimes you get things with it. We have a fifth steam generator, and we're installing that, and it's a very small cost. So there, that, th there's just things that we have there that prepare the asset for growth that will minimize the capital cost. And uh, we've been cautious because we're just not going to risk our balance sheet, and we don't want to spend our cash flow right now. And uh, we want to see things line out with differentials and make sure we're really protected there. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not exactly that. I don't want to mislead on that. <laughs> no, I, I think I think it's a so. 
we're gonna have to drill another set of well pairs and uh, to really take advantage of that steam, uh, extra steam. But I think the advantage instead of when we're ready to do that, instead of waiting two years to order a steam generator and install it at site stuff, it's there, it's ready to go. And not only that, but um, it helps with maintenance downtime because there's maintenance of course and you have a certain runtime. If you have excess steam available, that will pay out the install of that steam generator just there. So. Yes. Yes. Right. That steam gen will be installed for our capital program that we've announced, one hundred forty million dollars. It'll be. It's included in there. No, and I wouldn't recommend they do. <laughs> I just, uh, you know, I, th I think, I think it's op got operational benefits, and I think it's there for future, but. Um, I'm not going to promise any production uplift with it. Um, you know, like I, we did put that in our press release that that's something we consider. I mean, it wasn't so long ago we were dollar a share, and uh, which is hugely undervalued. So um, there may be some value there. I mean, clearly we th we still think we're uh, undervalued stock, and uh, I'm sure every CEO says that, but. Uh, I think we're showing some metrics that prove it. I think it's an option for us. We do have some limitations under our current debt indenture agreement, so that limit the amount that we can do, but it's certainly on our list of things that would be very constructive. <laughs> well, I always get on a soapbox on this topic, but uh, I, I mean, we've made our bet on the Keystone Excel pipeline and, and Kinder Morgan, and Keystone Excel has a hear hearing to go through this uh, summer in Nebraska. We think that that's going to be positive, an outcome, and uh, the president of the U.S. said he's committed to it, so I think it'll get built in his term, and the, out the, the impact of that, so we had some work done by Goldman uh, when we bought Statoil that if we could get to the coast of Canada, there's probably a $5 uplift just to get to the California refineries uh, via water. Nobody really knows the impact of getting to Asian refineries, but I think it's going to be pretty material. And uh, Keystone XL gets us to all the U.S. Uh, Gulf Coast refineries that are screaming for Canadian oil. I mean, Venezuela is going like this. Mexico is trying to fill it. Those refineries are built for us. And so um, that, that differential that we see of, of $20 right now and, and it has been more than $20, should be under pure pipeline um, uh, in the 10 to $11 range. That's the kind of uplift there is there. Yeah. Okay, thank you.